So we're just on top of the hour, so I think we can get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. And good afternoon for callers from Europe um, or other parts of the world. Um, my name is Dario Parziale, and I'm the Director of Investment Research at, at Tonic. Um, we are very excited today to be hosting this webinar focused on what every impact investor needs to know about ESG investing. Uh, in the past few years at Tonic, we have seen ESG investing going more and more mainstream. There are uh, lots of mutual funds on the market out there, and there is also an increasing number of uh, ESG exchange traded funds. There was an article about a week ago on Bloomberg stating that it's never been so cheap because of lowering fees to invest in ESG labeled funds. Um, another interesting piece of news is that about a month ago, the C CFA Institute released new guidelines requesting CFA charter holders to uh, consider ESG factors when material in their fundamental investment decision analysis. So, um, um, Given these trends, we believe that it was an important moment for us to organize a webinar around ESG investing and the, on the perspective of impact investors. And um, while talking with um, impact investors, there are a few questions which I think are, um, are recurring questions and we would like to address in this webinar. The first one is that there is not a single standard around ESG investing and the degree to which investment managers integrate ESG investing in their decision process varies. So what we want to do during this webinar is starting with an overview and uh, of the main approaches for ESG investing and also to understand how investors can tell them apart. Uh, we also want to discuss how ESG investing can influence portfolio construction what type of data are available for managers to take uh, meaningful decisions around ESG investing? And finally, a big question of how can ESG investing drive long-term impact creation? Um, these are all difficult questions. So in order to answer, answer them, we decided to turn to the experts. And um, ex experts in our community, like Lisa Hales from Boston Common Asset Management, Taham Mayimwala from RBC Global Asset Management, and Will Morgan at Sonnen Capital. Uh, before turning the presentation to them, uh, please let me give you an overview of, the, of how the webinar will work. We will have the first 45 to 50 minutes of conversation, uh, and it will really be a conversation, very few slides. Um, and during this conversation, you can uh, post questions at any time using the Q&A button that you see uh, in the lower part of your screen. So you can post questions at any time. We will also reserve the remaining 10 minutes of the call for, for questions in case we couldn't answer them right in the presentation. Uh, we will try to integrate questions if relevant to discussion, and if not, we will answer them in the final part of the call. Um, so without further ado, please let me introduce you to the moderator of today, Will Morgan, had of Impact and also Director of Impact at Sonnen Capital. Uh, Will has been leading the uh, impact management efforts at Sonnen for many years now, both in public strategies as well, in as, well as in private strategies. Um, he's been leading the impact uh, efforts both in the investment decision-making process, but also working with managers in uh, optimizing their, their impact management practices and reporting. So uh, we, we believe that you know, Will will be the perfect person to moderate this webinar. Will, I will let you uh, add a few words about uh, your uh, work and biographies, if there is something important I missed. And if not, uh, um, you can also introduce uh, the remaining two presenters and, uh, and start the conversation. Great, thank you, Dario. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here to moderate this discussion with these two colleagues. Um, and I'll briefly just, you know, we want this to be oriented towards practical information and solutions. So, you know, in that spirit, I'll tell you what the head of impact does. My role is simply trying to organize how our firm, Sonin, collects, manages, and reports impact information across our investment strategies. So that's my role on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Today, we're here to discuss what every impact investor needs to know about ESG investing. Um, and what we're hoping, again, is that this provides helpful, practical information for all of the audience uh, participants today. We have two great panelists. First is Lisa Hales. She's the Vice President of Institutional Investment Services at Boston Common. She works with their institutional clients and has deep experience in environmental, social, and governance issues herself. Uh, prior to joining Boston Common, she was at Vigio Iris in London, which is a provider of this ESG information to investors. So she knows these issues in and out. Our second panelist is Taham Mahamwala. He's a vice president and institutional portfolio manager at RBC. Uh, at that firm, he oversees the efforts to integrate environmental, social, and governance factors um, <clears throat> throughout the investment process. And as a consequence, he's become very informed on the issue. He's been in the field uh, in this industry since 2006. Uh, Taham, Lisa, I'm very happy to have you both today for this discussion. So here's what we hope to discuss today. We want really to define what ESG is. What does it really mean? When Dario mentioned uh, an ESG labeled fund, we really want to get to the bottom of what that actually means. Uh, so we'll start with some basic definitions and approaches. We're going to talk about how ESG factors and data is used in the portfolio construction process and in security selection itself. We want to talk about where the data comes from. Uh, how accurate is it? Uh, who verifies it? Uh, how can we make better use of those data points? Uh, and we want to also discuss how ESG itself relates to impact creation uh, through the investment process before, during, and after any investment is made. So we, again, we want to leave you with some practical, useful questions you can use as you begin to explore these issues with some of your own relationships with asset managers uh, to understand their capabilities. And as Dario said, we'll have a conversation. I do invite you to type in your questions so that uh, we can um, pepper the conversation uh, with some real-time information for you all. Um, and we'll have some Q&A at the end as well. So let's kick this off. Um, our first question is, how do we define ESG investing? How do we distinguish its various approaches? And again, Dario mentioned ESG labeled funds and how cost-effective they've become. But what does that really mean and how can we be sure that that's the real deal. Lisa, I'll start with you. Um, and what I'd love for you to do is to introduce yourself uh, and mention what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can bring this down to earth um, and all understand how things work for you. Uh, and then let's start tackling that first question. What is ESG investing and how do you define its various approaches? Thanks, Will. Uh, it's great to be on the call with you all. And uh, thanks to Daria for putting up this very useful slide. So uh, first, a quick, what do I do day to day? So I work for a firm that's dedicated to uh, integrating environmental, social, and governance factors into the investment process, um, has been since inception. And my role is to be a link between our clients and our investment team. So I serve as an advisor and a relationship manager to clients. And I also am responsible for engagements that my firm does directly with companies in our portfolio across sectors and globally actually around the issues of gender equality and racial justice. The racial justice work is very focused here in the United States. So I have both a relationship management hat and I also do um, engagement work with our portfolio companies. So I feel very fortunate to work at a firm which, um, which sees the value of doing uh, direct engagement with portfolio companies. and. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But in terms of my definitions or our definitions, how we understand uh, the evolution, I always think about it as three phases. Um, the first phase was socially responsible investing, which is illustrated on the slide. And that typically means um, you are either looking to exclude or even include companies or sectors uh, on, a, on criteria that are non-financial. And that was really about alignment with your values or with the, with the values of a particular investor. ESG, the integration of environmental, social, and governance factors is looking at the corporate performance uh, that um, related to environmental and social issues, those risks and opportunities that are not captured by traditional financial analysis. So 
though there's an, an awareness of the social or the societal impacts that those ESG factors may have, typically ESG on its own, both the risk mitigation side and the opportunity side or the revenue enhancing side is really about financial performance. And then for me, the final piece is kind of impact or here we've talked about SDG driven strategies. This is about really pursuing specific social and environmental outcomes deliberately and intentionally. I to say that though we've described them as kind of three phases, they actually can and do overlap um, for a lot of investment managers. You may find elements of all three or two or more amongst different managers. And, and part of the challenge is understanding what the manager means when they talk about they're an ESG manager. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And Taham, I'm going to pass the same question to you. Uh, and I would, again, like you to speak uh, in human terms on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and how that relates to this ESG. And then if you could um, embellish anything that Lisa said or provide any distinction, that would be great. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me. Good morning. Um, so my name is Taham Mahimwala, and I am an institutional portfolio manager on RBC uh, Global Equity Strategy. And uh, we run about $10 billion in our portfolios, and we've been managing since 2006. And ESG is a core part of our investment philosophy and the way we think about it. Um, so my role, I work with the team, but I also have the task of going out to our clients and prospects in the U.S. and, and educating them a little bit about what ESG is, how does, what is the right way to think about it. And when you are talking to portfolio managers, you know, as an advisor or as an asset owner, what are some of the questions you should be asking and understanding it the right way? So I am doing a lot of that these days in the U.S. just from an educational standpoint as well. So, you know, ESG, uh, I think Lisa covered it really well. She, you know, the, the evolution from socially responsible investing, which was the more negative screening, you know, values alignment where, you know, some organizations did not want alcohol, tobacco, uh, guns, those kind of screens to coming up to, you know, ESG integration from a risk standpoint. And then now it's also evolved of, uh, you know, Lisa touched upon this is, ESG from a return enhancement standpoint. And I'll tell you what ESG is not. ESG is not about saving the baby whale or being a hippie. And ESG is not a reduction in returns, okay? Um, in, in our opinion, ESG is, uh, first of all, a really poor acronym that the industry has come about. But I think it's, it's an enhanced analysis of companies. It's, as Lisa said, a better understanding of the risk and the opportunities both financial and extra financial. And we've noticed that, you know, over the years, the, the financial data that you get from, you know, 10 Qs and 10 Ks have really been commoditized. So as portfolio teams, like, you know, ours or Lisa's, um, what is the edge we have? And, you know, how do we bake that into our share evaluation? That's where these ESG or extra financial or non-financial factors come into play. That's how we think about it is, it's, it's having to understand what makes a company tick or what makes a company go bad in the future and how do we bake that into our analysis of investments. And this is numerous and ever shifting too. And as a fiduciary, I think every team and every portfolio manager should be incorporating this. Great, thank you both. And um, Tom, I've never heard it described as not being able to save the whales, perhaps uh, when we begin to talk about portfolio construction, we can talk about how we might um, factor that variable in. Um, so I, I wanted to move on now that we've covered these various approaches and we've talked about that spectrum. And uh, as you guys discussed, it was an evolution of sophistication in this process. With the advent of, of so many more funds who are saying that they are integrating ESG or they have a specific um, ESG approach. And I think it's become more and more important for investors and asset owners to be able to look under the hood and understand what this really means. And when they talk to either of you, how they may ask a series of questions that can help really help them understand exactly what your approach is, what your intention is, and how you think uh, that it would matter to them if they've come with that express interest. So 
what I wanted to discuss for the next five or 10 minutes was a series of questions that you guys might suggest for clients who are maybe going to be sitting across the table from you who want to understand what is your process? What do you offer? Uh, and, and tell me how this process works. Um, Taha, may we start with you and have you explain that? And then we'll have Lisa as well. So I think, um, you know, when, when asset owners go out to portfolio management teams and ask questions, I think that the first question that I think is extremely important is to understand the intentionality behind integrating ESG. Because a lot of times we, we have noticed that, you know, with the distilling of ESG to one particular number where you can have a score by MSCI, Sustainalytics, or any of the data providers, you sometimes don't get the intentionality of it. And I think one of the key questions that you need to ask an investment manager is, how does it fit his or hers investment philosophy and why every uh, stock is in a portfolio, there has to be a reason, what is the intentionality behind it and how have they thought about the ESG factors that, that are behind it. And again, you know, every sector, every industry have different important things that you need to consider from an ESG standpoint. It's not the same across the board. And I think having those discussions on why a particular stock is in the portfolio, what is the team thinking? And importantly, how are they engaging with management? Because I think ESG is more than just looking at data. It's also the other half of it is how do you, how does the management teams engage effectively and efficiently with the management teams of the portfolio companies? All right. Thank you, Tahan. Lisa, would you like to comment on that? Just uh, again, this is, how you might suggest making a series of questions that would help an asset owner understand exactly what his or her manager is actually trying to accomplish. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with Taham's comments about the intentionality. Really, it's important to understand why the investment man uh, believes ESG can, or in what way they believe ESG is going to enhance investment performance. And a series of questions about how do you integrate ESG issues, what ESG issues are considered, uh, for what sectors, what is your um, kind of investment time horizon, the, the kind of standard questions that uh, your advisors or consultants may be asking in terms of their own due diligence if you have one that you're working with, but with an extra or added um, sense of wanting to understand how is this manager attempting to use ESG information to enhance their uh, investment process? Um, and also, I think a really good question to ask is, what resources do you have devoted internally mm -hmm. to the implementation of ESG for your firm? You know, at my firm, we are 35 staff, but, um, and our investment team is 15 people. That's an integrated team. So essentially, we have four ESG analysts and we have our standard global um, sector analysts, but they together form our integrated ESG team. So they all have knowledge and expertise that's being brought to bear in building our portfolios. And I think, um, you know, as, as a firm that's 100% dedicated to this, we may be we're proselytizing on the, on, the on the topic of ESG and wanting to um, explain and encourage all investors. I think Taham made a really good point at the end about, about engagement for us. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about impact later, but the, the way to have impact in public equities is very much linked to using your voice as an investor to engage directly with management to engage even in the public domain with regulators and policymakers around the regulatory framework that impacts how companies operate. And we can see how that can shift um, what companies do, their, their products, their services, and how they treat their, their supply chain, et cetera. So those are uh, concrete ways that investors can influence really large companies for the better. I think Lisa raises another good point too, is just that, that having the resources at the firm, I think that's extremely important. The other thing that I mentioned, I forgot to mention one thing is, you know, understanding the, the ownership perspective of your managers. So, you know, if you're a short term holder of securities, where you're trading in and out of stocks, you're not really more motivated to incorporate some of these factors because a lot of these ESG factors do take a while. 
to you know incorporate whether it's bad or good you need to understand that so you need to have that long term ownership mindset um rather than just a trading mindset uh when you sort of think about ESG in your portfolios that's a great point um thank you both let me just ask one more question uh when you speak with clients who have expressed an interest in pursuing some ESG integration or who have um you know they've they've come to you to kind of understand your process what's their level of expectation about um what they understand on a quarterly or on an annual basis about the ESG profile of the portfolio that you've assembled uh are they happy with knowing simply that you guys are taking these factors into consideration or do they expect um any specific data or view on how the e and the s and the g are all performing um so I, i can try and tackle that one first so we uh have clients who range from uh high net worth families to very large uh institutions and their approaches may vary slightly but i think there is there's across the board a hope and an expectation that if they're investing with us they would like to know that the investments are not causing harm first and mm-hmm. foremost they want to do no harm to the extent that they can avoid that and they would like to see some positive impacts though they may not really understand or know exactly what kinds of positive impacts are possible so i think it's it behooves us as as uh investment professionals to provide a reporting to our clients that tries to capture understanding that no single you know data point is going to capture all there is to know about a portfolio but tries to provide with some information that helps them uh distinguish between between managers so one of the things we've done for many years is um we've car- we carbon footprint all our strategies and report out to our clients on the carbon footprint and we compare it to the benchmark so even though we don't um market our strategies as low carbon uh all of our strategies are uh, significantly lower in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than uh their equivalent benchmarks and then we also have reported um on the social impacts that mm-hmm. are generated via the companies in our portfolio so we we've, we've we've actually started in the last uh 2 years to map our portfolio to the sustainable development goals mm-hmm. so we've tried to demonstrate to what extent our companies in the portfolio um contributing to achievement of the sustainable development goals and i think that actually it flows back from our investment thesis oftentimes we invest in companies because we see that they have a business line or a product or some combination that is helping that we believe is going to be important for the transition to a more sustainable economy globally and so we are essentially taking up making a bet on their ability to do that and that i think is one of the benef- benefits of ESG analysis it's identifying things that the market as a whole may not be um may not be paying attention to or not paying enough attention to um that we believe is going to be important going forward part of the issue is that you know markets are all about the future and so much of the data that um uh is used is backward looking mm. so you know we're we're trying to understand you know how companies think about the challenges that they're facing what their strategy will be in terms of you know um high you know a different energy mix and a rising middle class in the emerging markets and you know a whole bunch of macro factors that are going to play out for companies and all off the base of a of a um ecosystem that is under enormous strain so companies that can use um resources efficiently that treat their employees like assets and not as costs um that are thinking uh proactively about managing their supply chain minim- you know minimizing turnover these are all indicators of forward thinking management and quality uh which we believe are going to eventually um you know show up uh, as as a financial benefit so um I mean I think I'll I'll just end it there but I I I think uh our our role is to provide our clients with information on uh 
to the extent that we can using the data available, there is a variety of data available and it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story, but it's helpful as one of many data points in terms of evaluating um, the, the, the social profile of a portfolio. Thanks, Lisa. And Tom, would you have a response to that? Yes, so we have a, a client profile that's very similar to Lisa. We've got, you know, um, um, individual high net worth families all the way to large institutions in our uh, fund across the globe, in fact, across Australia, Asia, and Europe. And, uh, you know, we, so in our portfolios, you know, we obviously present all the metrics. So, you know, how does the portfolio do on the ESG governance uh, factors against MSCI, against Sustainalytics? We do the carbon footprinting as well. Again, with the with the caveat that look, look think of these numbers as just something that you know uh, our portfolios are better in all these numbers but doesn't mean this is the only way to think about it our clients want much more transparency and you know lisa and I, I, as i'm hearing her our philosophies align quite a bit in the way we think about companies right so we have a phrase on the team we call contingent assets and contingent liabilities and what is these are as an accountant you know we always think of assets and liabilities in balance sheet and income statements, but if you look at company numbers, they don't reflect everything. Yeah, let me, I would just wanna share this slide here quickly. Um, this shows you that over time, how much of, um, oh, I don't know what happened here. Um, we can see it. You can see the slide with the intangibles? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is just basically shows how much of the market has gone from tangible assets into intangible assets. So about 90% of the value derived from companies is coming from intangible assets, which is not reflected in the numbers. So how do you think about this is as a contingent liability or contingent asset? And our clients wanna know that, right? So what we do is every quarter in terms of reporting, we also publish our engagements with every company we've done uh, for that quarter whether those companies are in a portfolio or companies that we are evaluating to have in our portfolios. And we sort of publish that for our clients. And what that sort of does is enables them, if you look at this over the past four or five quarters, you will see an evolution of conversations. And sometimes it again brings it back to the framework is, if there is a contingent asset, sometimes the company is doing the right thing, but it's not disclosing it. And we've seen that especially for the, the mid cap, smaller cap names in the emerging market countries, how do we as managers enable the management teams to sort of allow them to start disclosing certain things, which can help them improve their cost of capital over time. So you see those discussions and a client want transparency in the kind of conversations we're having. So I think the more transparent you are with your clients and prospects, just about the way you think about it, I think it's always helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. I, I think um, that's helpful. I see one question coming in about, um, how uh, ESG integration may relate to impact performance. I think we'll save that for um, um, a section down below where we're gonna talk about how ESG relates to impact creation. I think that's an important topic today. Um, can we spend five or 10 minutes on a question about how ESG factors really practically influence portfolio construction for either of your firms and your practices? Um, are, are there strategies that can skew one way or the other? Let's say I care a great deal about issues relating to labor and, and social and health and safety of the workforce, or I care a great deal about governance, or I care about saving the whales, Tom, as you mentioned. Can you guys talk about how you take all of this, this veritable sea of information and data and make practical use about security selection and how you pick one company over another or how the whole portfolio uh, comes together uh, with these views in mind. And Taham, I'll invite you to go first, if you would, please. Sure. Yeah, so we have this framework, which I call the contingent asset and contingent liabilities. And this is where, you know, we bake this into our investment philosophy and process. So every company that we look at our, we run very concentrated portfolio. So we run about 30 names in our, 30, 31 names in a global equity portfolio right now. And we also run an international equity portfolio with similar number of names. So having that security selection into a portfolio construction is extremely important for us. So we start off, you know, from an idea generation standpoint, but then once we've identified a company, we have a framework that we call the competitive dynamics framework. 
and management and ESG analysis is an important part of it. So we think of it as, you know, again, from a contingent asset standpoint, we want to identify things that a company is doing right now that is not being reflected in the balance sheet or income statement. And how do we identify those and put it into a valuation framework so that, again, it's an inefficiency, right? So as portfolio managers, you want to, at the end of the day, think about strong risk adjusted returns. So you want to exploit the inefficiency that the market hasn't captured and understand it better. So there are, you know, for example, uh, uh, some tech companies that are really further along in this whole driverless cars, you know, um, um, technology. But when you look at their balance sheet or income statements, that technology is not reflected. We think that's a contingent asset. A contingent liability, on the other hand, could be, you know, something that a firm's not doing. And how do we mitigate that risk into a portfolio by not owning those companies? So, you know, we've got plenty of examples, the whole, you know, Volkswagen uh, diesel, you know, scandal or the BP or the mining accident that recently happened. You know, how do you think about this that could happen and avoid those companies? We bake that into our fundamental assessment. We put it into a valuation framework from a scenario analysis because a lot of these factors, you don't know when they'll come into fruition, but what you want to do is analyze as a portfolio manager, you know, let's say in three years, the contingent asset comes into fruition. There's a 10% probability it could be a $2 billion business. You want to do all the scenario analysis, put it back into your share price. Um, so that's the framework, but that's not portfolio construction. That's our investment philosophy is looking at these non-financial factors. Now our portfolio construction process is a little more, uh, 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 you know, uh, complicated in the sense that we use seven different risk models. We have three risk management experts embedded on the team. When we want to build our portfolios, we want to ensure that the, the risk and the return of our portfolios is reflecting our investment philosophy. A lot of these ESG non-financial factors. So we try and maximize the idiosyncratic part of our portfolio and minimize all the other factor pairs. So that could be value, growth, momentum, blind factor, whatever that could be. So we do that by adding a few incremental names to a portfolio and efficiently bringing that idiosyncratic risk up. So that way our returns reflect our investment philosophy. Now, the bigger question is, you know, everyone says, can you measure ESG? The answer is not. It is no attribution system that can help you measure ESG, you know, how it's helped you or how it's not helped you. But what you can look at from a manager's standpoint is how much of that idiosyncratic risk are they taking? Because that's company specific. That's, you know, the computer cannot pinpoint that and say, you know, um, you know, this would happen to the management teams or this is the culture or this is how it's treating its employees in terms of R&D. We want to analyze that and put it into our, our framework. Okay, Tom, thank you. That's great. And Lisa, um, you know, one of the things we talked about is some of these focused funds on gender lens investing or an energy efficiency or climate change or the circular economy um, and using ESG to begin to orient a portfolio in one of those directions. Can you talk about how that works in practice for you? Sure. So I think um, we, I should say, I should preface this by saying we are a core large cap manager. So we build large cap diversified portfolios against um, regular benchmarks, the S&P 500, uh, the MSCI IFA, And we are trying to build portfolios that both have a higher sustainability profile than the benchmark and then using engagement to improve companies via, you know, our dialogue with them. But there are, if you're an investor and you're looking at the huge sea of funds that you could select, I think understanding that there are thematic funds that are focused on uh, gender lens investing and or climate change solutions. So the gender lens investing funds may, may well be diversified in that they own companies across many sectors, but they may have some inbuilt biases because they're gonna favor sectors where there are more women, as we know, the women may make up 50% of the population, they are missing in leadership and um, governance structures in many, many sectors around the globe. So that, uh, that type of approach may introduce um, some biases depending on how the manager goes about building uh, the portfolio. For us, we actually have 
similar to Taham and, and RBC's approach, a comprehensive framework which describes uh, in detail the kinds of companies we seek. We have a, a set of characteristics in terms of sustainability leadership that we're trying to identify and, and trying to use as a lens when we're looking for companies. So we are an active manager. So we're stock picking and we're trying to build portfolios of our best ideas, which means we're always looking, sifting through to try and figure out which companies are best going to uh, meet the kinds of profile that we think are going to be performative over the long term. And I think one of the things, because we're a large cap manager and we invest very broadly, I wanted to um, talk about a, a sector that's somewhat difficult for uh, potentially difficult for responsible investors, which is energy. Um, and Dario, can I ask you to bring up that slide on the energy sector? Thanks. So this is just a little description of how we uh, think about investing in what can be a challenging sector because of its environmental impacts and also its human rights impacts. We tend to have uh, a seek and avoid uh, dichotomy. Where we invest in oil and gas, we're going to look for the best companies um, that we can find. And there are some segments of the oil and of the energy um, sector as a whole that we will not invest in. And that actually, I think, speaks to the importance of screening out as part of your ESG approach. You may find there are some activities that are simply incompatible with what you believe is necessary for the shift to a more sustainable future. And therefore, there are companies or sectors, subsectors that you, you will avoid. And we do as part of our process. And we think um, it's for both reasons. It's for reasons to do with what is the most sustainable choice. And it's also for the downside risk that we think is embedded there. So we don't invest in things like nuclear power uh, or coal-fired power plants. Um, or tar sands, or corn ethanol. Those are all things that we avoid. On the seek side, we're going to look for our best in class. We're going to seek substitutions where we can. And we're going to invest in renewables where they fall within our opportunity set. So I think as any, um, we are investors first and foremost. And when building these large cap diversified portfolios, we're going to build them looking for the best companies we can uh, that fall within um, the opportunity set that makes sense for our clients. So we're not going to invest in a name that's attractive from a renewable perspective that isn't financially attractive as well. So I think it's, it's building a portfolio that's diversified and balanced uh, in terms of its impact opportunity and its financial opportunity, which is frankly the challenge for any active manager um, who's trying to, to um, build a strategy that is that can um, can deliver impacts on both sides. Okay, great. Um, thank you both. And I'm, I'm looking at a, a handful of questions that have come in. I wanna make sure that we um, allow some time for that. Um, let's spend just a couple minutes. One question is about talking about the veracity and the accuracy of the ESG data itself. Mm -hmm. uh, can you guys both comment on um, this, uh, the variety of providers and how you recommend that um, investors gain confidence that the information is useful, accurate, uh, and um, something that they can rely upon. Lisa, will you go first? Sure. So having worked for a provider, I have strong views on this topic. <laughs> what I would say is that all providers provide useful information, but it's like, it's like five or six people who are blindfolded touching an elephant. You know that metaphor. You may think you're holding a rope or a tree trunk or something else, depending on what part of that elephant you're touching. And mm -hmm. similarly, ESG research providers are collecting a very wide variety of data using different methodologies with different assumptions embedded. I think they're useful as a reference, but they're not actually useful to rely on as a kind of be all and end all for knowing the sustainability um, profile of any particular company or even a portfolio. They're an indicator. Um, I think ESG information is such that it really requires expert, uh, experienced um, interpretation to make it useful 
in an investment process. And that's why we have and have since inception an internal team that alongside the sources of, of data, you know, we use MSCI, we, we use Visio Iris, we use RefRisk, we've used some other um, regional sources of information for some of our uh, strategies as well. Those are inputs alongside many other inputs, alongside the direct information that we gather from engaging with companies that are in our portfolio. Every single name that is in our portfolio has had a detailed profile from both an ESG perspective and a financial an assessment before it goes in to the portfolio. So I would just caution that though, I think, uh, you know, I welcome uh, the rise of all the myriad uh, ESG providers. Um, competition in a marketplace helps, um, you know, there's something for everyone essentially. But I, I would just caution that relying on one or even multiple use, you know, to provide you with a number, the definitive, this, this company's an eight and this one's a 7.6, I would caution because I think the, the, the availability of data doesn't allow for those kind of nuanced, um, uh, the ability for us to distinguish on that nuanced a level. You can, and, and internally we actually have an assess, we assess companies and we kind of group, group them as either leaders or kind of above average or average or essentially not investable because we think you can group them in that sense, you can get a sense of kind of which companies are really outstanding, which ones are above average in their sector, uh, which ones are average or which ones are just essentially not, um, not attractive to us because of our ESG lens. But I don't think, and I have not seen evidence to say that we can definitively say 8.6 here and oh, this one's only an 8.2, much harder from an ESG perspective to do. Okay, Lisa, thank you. And Taham, will you comment on that and help I think us? I totally, I totally agree. We have, you know, we say on our team is that ESG is an opinion and not a fact, right? So all these, you know, it's, it's been great, the proliferation of all the data providers, because I think it helps us all to understand some of the issues that are prevalent or some of the, you know, the, uh, the assets, the contingent assets that are there in the company. But there's a really good paper that came out about a year or two years ago and I can send it around, Dario, to you if you want to distribute it later on. It's uh, by this Professor Chatterjee and, and a university. And they looked at six different ESG providers and ran a correlation regression against them. Mm -hmm. And they found that they don't agree more than half of the time. Yeah. Right. And that's why it's an opinion. There is no right or wrong in ESG. It's how it fits your investment philosophy. And that's why for us, too, like Lisa said, you know, we don't rely on just these data sources we definitely use them, right? So we have MSCI, we have access to Sustainalytics, we have access to a new uh, data source we started using called True Value Labs, we use Classdoor scores. You know, all these different judgments are evalu as, as is put as part of our evaluation of the security, but at the end of the day, we push it down to the sector specialist and say, you know, you figure out what's important for your particular sector industry and help take these data sources, put it as part of your analysis, but you make the judgment of what's good or what's bad from an ESG standpoint. And the other thing is this whole engagement piece of it. I think that's where it helps too, where you're not just looking at data sources. If you push it down to the sector specialist, and if let's say I'm making a decision whether I can buy or sell a security of a healthcare company, for example, and if I'm sitting in front of the CEO or the board of directors, I get much more credibility and much more access to those guys rather than just talking to the CR, CSR person. And you can ask the right question. So we've used Glassdoor for that quite a bit. So we found that Glassdoor, you know, every company at least has to have about 100 ratings or more um, to sort of have, make it more statistically significant. And we did a regression and it's an upward sloping curve where higher Glassdoor scores correlate to higher sales per employee, which is higher productivity. But in my mind, that's common sense, right? Happy employees will be more productive. But what it really helps us to do is from an engagement standpoint. So let's say one of our team's sector specialists is sitting in front of a, a, a financial services company CEO, and the CEO is telling us something, and we read on Glassdoor that the employees in Texas are saying something different, we can ask them some pointed questions. And, and again, get analysis on, you know, why is there a difference in the story and what are we missing here as, as an analyst or a portfolio manager? So I think it really helps us. So you, you look at all these data sources, but you make your own judgment 
on what's important and what's not. Very nice. Thank you, Tom. I, th I think that was helpful from both of you. Um, I want to spend just a uh, ask for a very brief response from both of you before we get into some questions. Uh, and, and this is something that I think is very important for the audience to hear from you both, um, which is how we think ESG, uh, however it's employed or used or integrated, relates to positive impact creation or possibly avoiding negative impact. Uh, I think oftentimes public equities <clears throat> are, are diminished for their potential to create positive change. Um, and I think it would be useful to help hear from both of you about does this, is this part of uh, making the world a better place or of impact investing? Uh, and, and please um, keep your, brief, your comments a little bit brief just so we can get to some questions. Tom, why don't we hear from you first on this? I think the short answer is yes, it definitely does because you know, studies after studies have now found that sustainable companies are actually more profitable over the long term and it's actually doing better from environment, social or governance aspect, right? And we all live in a small world at the end of the day. So we want to, you know, put our dollars towards companies that are doing good by, you know, society as a whole. And, you know, if you can also make money in that process, why not? Right? So, yeah. So I think it's a simple answer is yes, it definitely helps. And sustainability is here to stay for sure. Yeah, I, I, I would love to say there's three areas or three um, uh, buckets that I think of when I think about impact and public equities for us. For Boston Common, we think about the ESG integration. So obviously shifting more capital towards companies which are forward thinking, which are, which are moving in the direction of more, a more sustainable economy. Two is our engagement work. We have a comprehensive engagement program published, an impact report that's come out um, uh, in, in, that comes out in the fall that identifies how we have successfully moved companies in terms of their policies, their practices, and their products. All very important. So, and the third part is leadership. It's influencing other investors, forming collaborations. We're small, but in fact, we have an outsized impact mm -hmm. with our voice, I would argue, because of our ability to leverage and bring together uh, groups of investors uh, to, to speak. So we've done a huge amount of work around banks and climate change, for example, that has successfully leveraged a, a, a global investor coalition of over a trillion dollars in assets. So our voice is amplified via the work of, of the collaborators that we have and therefore our impact. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and now I, I have, a, I think I have a dozen questions here that I'd love to get to. I would invite uh, other members and participants to please send them along. We'll try to get to as many as we can today. We'll do a little rapid fire uh, question here. And because uh, it's relevant to the topic we just discussed and Tahama, a comment you made about uh, sustainability actually enhancing corporate performance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question that seems to express some skepticism that ESG integration um, does or does not uh, enhance or reduce financial returns. Uh, and so this audience member has not found any evidence to suggest that it does. Uh, and I'm wondering if we could share some resources or some empirical data that would suggest otherwise. Sure. So it definitely does. And there are more, as I said, studies coming out now. Again, there's no attribution to sort of, you know, uh, uh, demystify my returns or excess returns and say X percentage has come from ESG and X percentage is not. But there are studies now that are coming out showing this. And let me share a few slides, actually. Um, I do have it handy um, right here. So this shows that ESG potentially, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch did the study. Uh, can you guys see the slide? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And this shows that if you just have a quant and ESG factor combined together versus just a pure quant factor, over time, your information ratio has increased across all quant factors, right? So this is uh, one analysis of that. The second one is this, your average pairwise correlations go down when you think about these ESG factors, because at the beginning, remember I mentioned these are idiosyncratic company specific matters. And if you sort of build this into your portfolio, it automatically will bring down your correlation because it won't correlate to all the other factors out there. So it helps you again from an information ratio standpoint, and there's a study that came out um, about engagement. And, you know, it's really hard to say how much value does engagement add or not. And this was 
Elroy Dimson, who did the study and said, you know, again, take this with a grain of salt, but it's actually a good, directionally, it's a good study which says engagements, all engagements, no matter successful or unsuccessful, will add about 1% of uh, excess return to your monthly adjusted returns. If you have successful uh, engagements over time, you can see that curve on the top line. It could add up to about six or seven percent of excess returns over time. So again, you know, this study was done for particular asset managers and looking at their financial records. But there is a lot and lot, uh, you know, science that is saying that you know this helps returns over time, and then it also helps risk mitigation. So that helps your returns over time too if you're avoiding the risky companies. Tom, excellent. And thank you so much for providing that data right on the spot. Lisa, do you have anything to comment there or respond to? Yeah, I would, I would just say that um, ESG analysis is, it's particularly useful for active managers because we're trying to find as many information sources as we can to gain an, you know, to gain an advantage in order to, to figure out which companies will outperform in the future. Investing is all about what's going to happen in the future not what's happened in the past. And I think where we're standing now and at our economy and how, our, um, how it operates, we are shifting from, an, from a, our previous paradigm to a new paradigm. And so ESG analysis helps us identify which companies are positioned to do that. I cannot say that ESG analysis always inevitably leads to outperformance. I don't think there's any investment at, you know, approach or thesis that could always do that. I, don't, I sometimes feel that we hold up ESG as requiring some like incredible bar that no other <laughs> investment approach uh, needs to meet. I think if you're an investor that's concerned about uh, how your capital is deployed, that you want it to be invested in a way that is consistent with values that you hold, that finding managers that are aligned with that with your perspective that utilize ESG as part of their process is a no brainer. Okay, that's great. And that's a beautiful segue into the next question we have, um, <clears throat> which is interesting. It's about how uh, larger firms, particularly Taham RBC, something of that size and scale can institutionalize ESG and, and the sensibility there. Um, this questioner has noted that there are small pockets of big firms that seem to have this interest and passion and they may be catering to a client's need, uh, but then there's the remainder of the firm which may be um, completely uh, operating in isolation of, of that practice. So I'm wondering if I could hear from both of you about how and if this sensibility of non-financial factors, sustainability elements, is going to be institutionalized and much more commonplace across investment practices. Would one of you like to go first on that? I can start. Um, um, so I think as a big firm, again, I think it's absolutely right. You know, how do you incorporate that into across your different investment teams? I think that's where UNPRI plays a big role. So we are signatories to UNPRI. And when you become a signatory, you know, you are basically saying that we have, tried, we have, we have integrated this across all our investment teams. Now that integration could be different across investment teams, right? There are some teams, even within RBC, who are doing this from an engagement standpoint, from just not looking at data sources. There are some teams who are trying to build this out into, you know, how do we look at this and how does this help our analysis? I think there's a spectrum and you cannot expect every manager to do it the same way because again, at the end of the day, how does it fit your investment philosophy and process? But I think the advantage that a big firm like RBC brings is, having that firepower in when it comes to engagement. So we have a corporate governance team that sits up in Toronto and they look at all the investment teams. So I'm part of the global equity team. We operate like investment boutiques where we make our own decisions. We don't have a CIO who's saying, buy this, buy that. We have our own team. Then there's the EM equity team, then there's US small cap growth team. The corporate governance team up in Toronto looks at that. But what happens is, let's say we want to go and have a shareholder proposal for a certain company in our, in our, in our portfolio we can leverage the bigger powers to be of RBC because across the board, RBC could own much more of the shares of a certain company than, you know, individually we could as a portfolio. So we can use that to our advantage to have some of the positive engagements as well. So I think there are advantages, there are disadvantages, but I think as a firm, again, you need to look at how is it being driven from a top down? 
is the CEO vested? How is the firm doing, you know, in terms of their own corporate governance and culture? And is it, does it seep down through the investment philosophy of that, at, that, that firm or an organization or does it? Thank you, Tahan. Lisa? Yeah, so I, I work for a, a small firm, which is 100% dedicated to this. So I think um, to Taham's point, this is about organizational change and about how you um, change incentives to align with more sustainable outcomes. So one of the issues that I've been working on is, as a small example, is increasing diversity uh, throughout uh, senior management ranks. So we have co-filed a resolution. We don't file a lot of resolutions, but we do some. And we filed co-filed a resolution uh, with Google around linking executive pay, senior executive pay, with achieving more diversity in in, man, in management ranks. And so that's that's kind of a concrete way to shift how large institutions think. I mean, when your paycheck is linked to getting something right. People tend to work on it with, you know, with more vigor than other otherwise. So I think as investors, we have an opportunity to, and, and though we are small, I think um, we have had significant impact on some very large companies due to our, you know, in, you know, intense uh, uh, examination of what issues are relevant and making the business case two companies. We've worked with CVS over the last at least five years. And last year or two years ago, they announced that they were removing uh, some significant chemicals of concern from 600 uh, of their own brand beauty products. That's a, that's a small example of the kinds of impacts that can be had. Um, in terms of what large firms can do, again, I think it's it's organizational culture, it's aligning uh, pay and incentives, and as Taham says, it is driven from from the top. If you have your C-suite endorse this and push it down, it's much more likely uh, it's much more likely to actually um, have legs. Makes a huge difference. Good. Okay. Um, We've got just three minutes left and uh, a couple of remaining questions are quite similar. Um, one is, can we give an example of a real case of how ESG was integrated into a client's investment? I think we've just heard a couple of examples. The second related question is, um, the decision to divest from fossil fuels or not, does that increase the sustainability of a portfolio or not? And it occurs to me, Taham, that your remark is that, you know, ESG isn't an answer, but it's how it in fits into your investment philosophy. Yeah. So I would say, you know, the decision to invest in fossil fuels or not um, depends very much on a client's preference. Uh, but if I could invite you guys both to, re to remark quickly on that before we close today. Yeah, no, we run a fossil fuel free strategy as well for some of our university clients. And again, that's where, you know, they've gotten a lot of push from the student body saying they don't want to invest in any fossil fuels. So we're, they've taken a global flagship global strategy and ex asked us to S out our energy holdings in there. That's fine. As long as clients understand that that's what they want to do and it aligns with their investment uh, philosophy and what they want to do. As a, philo as a team, we believe to be inclusive rather than exclusive. So, you know, I think Lisa touched upon this earlier on. We're against the big strand stranded assets debate, right? We, the big energy companies. But energy is part of what we do. Now, we cannot fly a 777 tomorrow without fuel. We need fuel for that. A lot of emerging markets are actually dependent on that. What you want to do is you want to have the cleaner, the LNG aspect of it, the liquefied natural gas, which is a much cleaner you know, energy rather than a lot of the big oils. So you sort of change your perspective a little bit that way and have some cleaner energy. We need energy. It's not going away anywhere for the next 10, 15 years. So how do you, you know, take that? Yeah, I agree. I guess I would turn it back to the, the questioner and say, do they think a portfolio that is excluding excluding fossil fuels is more sustainable than one that has fossil fuels? Um, because it, partially it's a values-based question. Partially, even if you exclude fossil fuels, it's important to make sure that the manager doesn't load up on other types of extremely energy intensive companies in certain uh, a concrete or you know, mining, whatever, to get the same factor exposure. But you know, essentially, um, Xing out the ability, you know, they're, if they're trying to kind of lower the greenhouse gas emissions of their portfolio, it's important to understand 
how the manager excludes fossil fuels. Are they aligned philosophically with you? And you can only know that by asking because I'm, I'm, unfortunately the scores and the ratings do not tell you about the intentions. Mm -hmm. So we don't invest in, you know, uh, very many large integrated oil companies. There may be a manager that you find tomorrow that doesn't have any large integrated oil companies today because from a financial perspective, it's unattractive. But if it becomes attractive six or nine months from now, and they, are they going to invest? And is that aligned? That's why the intentions matter. It's not just what's in the portfolio at a snapshot in time. It's how will that person or that firm manage your money in accordance going forward? And, and with divestment, you lose a seat at the table. And that's the truth. That's a great way for us to conclude today. Um, I think that's a powerful example. I want to thank you both, Lisa and Taham, for participating and for, for Tonic for hosting this. I hope that we've given some uh, useful information on these different approaches to ESG integration and, and how it can affect a portfolio's construction and how an investor might pursue impact or sustainability in his or her investment portfolio. And I, I, I would just encourage all of you not to be intimidated by this. It's, oh, it's a big topic. Uh, it's, comp it's complicated. There's some conflicting information, uh, but it's just oozing with potential for investors uh, and um, for this world and this planet. So I would encourage everyone who's interested to keep uh, pressing ahead and talking to people like uh, you're hearing from today on this panel. And um, Dario, maybe I can pass it back to you. Yeah, no, thank you, Will, for this beautiful closing. I would really like to thank our presenters today, Tom and Lisa, and for you for having beautifully moderated this conversation. I think that uh, this will provide uh, an understanding of what is behind the scenes and what is uh, our portfolio is managed by professional managers. And I think this is a great toolkit for our impact investors when they are thinking about uh, a fund, not to only look at the holdings of the fund, but go a bit beyond and think about what is the strategy. And I think this can provide a toolkit to engage either with a fund manager, if that's a possibility, or even more often to, eng to engage with a wealth manager who is actually selecting those funds. And the wealth manager could actually bridge those questions to the fund manager. So I really would like to thank you all for joining this webinar and for having stayed with us through the end. And we can come to closing now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.